don't be afraid to pitch yourself because you never know who's going to say yes. A few years ago now, I pitched like a big, like I guess you'd call her reality star. I was like, I'm just going to email her assistant and see like whatever. They'll probably say no, but it's worth a shot. They responded back. It was a yes. I went to LA, recorded the episode in person, and it was huge. It was Whitney Port from the Hills. If I would have let my mind be like, no, I wouldn't miss out on that opportunity, right? So pitch and, and don't worry about how big their audience is because if they like your topic and it's relevant, they feel it would be a value to their listen- listeners, they'll have you on. If they're not willing to pay you like X amount of hundreds or thousands of dollars right away, start with the affiliate link where you share it. And if people buy, you get a percentage because what if 500 people buy that thing? That's going to be a really good, right? Even if 10 people buy it and you have 10 companies that you have affiliate links with and you're making X hundreds or thousands of dollars a month, that's another source of income all of a sudden, right? right? And then eventually they'll be like, hey, we've noticed numbers are up. Like we want to invest in more ads. Or Don't be afraid to negotiate. Honor your value and your worth. And at the same time, also be realistic with your numbers and what your da- downloads and things are. And don't expect that if you have, right, like, I don't know, 500 downloads a week, I wouldn't expect like a 10K payday or even like a $5,000 payday unless your audience is like almost every listener is purchasing, right? Some small accounts have a very magnetic, very involved audience that will drop money. But unless you have that, be willing to negotiate a bit. But I really know my value and my worth and what my time is worth and and the investment into the sponsorships. If you want to build a legitimate, profitable online business without shiny objects, without the hypey gimmicks, and without the stress and overwhelm, if you want to make more money without having to be present online all day, every day, pumping out content that nobody sees and hustling DMs to generate leads and sales, then this is the place for you. Welcome to the Digital Trailblazer Podcast, your online business university, where you'll learn how ordinary people start from ground zero with no influence, no email list or audience to sell to, and no business or marketing experience, and go from working nine to five jobs to building successful six and seven figure online businesses and all the steps in between. Learn the strategies that worked and what didn't, learn the mistakes that they made and how to avoid them, and then learn their plans for scaling their businesses and taking things to the next level all so that you can build your business faster and easier and make more money without sacrificing the things that are important to you in your life. I'm your host, Leah Ray Getz, and with me is my husband, Todd. Now let's get to it with today's guest. Welcome, Digital Trailblazers. We are super excited to have with us Amber Romaniak. We are pumped. She has done amazing things with podcasting. She's made over $2 million with her podcast. So we're going to get into all the good stuff with how she's done that, how to grow and monetize your podcast. But first, Amber, kind of introduce yourself because you're that's like not your thing and how you're making money is podcasts, like teaching podcast monetization or anything. You actually have a beautiful wellness business and you're doing some other stuff. So go ahead, let the audience know what you're all about. And then we'll get into the nitty gritty of all the cool content stuff. Yeah. And thank you for having me. I'm super excited. So yeah, I started as an emotionally eating digestive and hormone expert and I've had my business for 11 years now. And I really specialize in supporting and helping women all over the world gain what I call food and body freedom, which is fully healing, binge eating, food addiction, emotional eating, healing their relationship with food, their body, clearing out the weight loss blocks, and then deeply investigating the hidden hormone issues, gut issues, inflammation, and kind of disempowerment that comes with not feeling well, feeling out of power with your health, fighting with your body and food. So there's a lot of mindset work, emotional, energetic healing, and then of course, a lot of physical healing. And about a year into my business, I started a podcast with a co-host, which ended the following year. And I've been solo for almost nine years now, but I never expected my business to then also start integrating business support. So I've had a lot of clients and other people be like, you're so good at the way you show up in your business. Like you have proof of success. You've had a full-time business for 11 years. Like multi-million dollars over the years like can can you help me and so that has naturally just kind of been integrated into the work and what I see with so many business owners is the burnout in business their businesses are running them because they don't have boundaries and they're a lack mentality so they're letting that lead because they're so afraid that like if they don't respond to their client at 2 a.m that they're gonna lose the client and lose the money um, and so that lack and that unworthiness is leading their choices. And so they're people pleasing, overgiving, and have no boundaries. So the coaching is really stemmed into that because what they're starting to realize is as if I'm not having boundaries, I don't feel good enough, I'm leading from lack. I'm in a low vibration. I'm attracting things I don't want. 
and it's not working the way it could and I feel like garbage. My health is declining and that is a huge cost to have your business negatively impact your health to the level that you end up with serious health issues. So that's all kind of come together. And then part of the strategy piece around like showing up authentically, speaking like your truth and from your heart, because that's one of the reasons my podcast has been so successful because I wear my heart on my sleeve. I share lovingly, authentically, but I also light the fire under people's butts and call them out because that's what's needed, especially when you want to make change and do deep work. And then next year in 2025, I do plan to start doing podcast support and coaching. I've actually had three clients this week that are like, hey, I want to start a podcast. Can you help me and coach me on it? So it's like naturally all organically just unfolding and I'm flowing with it because it's just so much fun. So yeah, that's me in a nutshell. I love it. I love it. So let's talk podcasting because we've had a lot of people on. They're talking about you know, the importance of podcasting. Obviously, we podcast. We think it's really important. But when it comes to actually growing the podcast and monetizing the podcast, that's often where things fall short. A lot of people get started, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that have a podcast. <laughs> There's not a lot of people that are actually using it to drive business and revenue successfully yeah. for them. So let's let's start, start at the beginning with this. Like, Who do you suggest should be doing a podcast and how to actually start this whole podcasting journey? Yeah. So I think if you have a message or a story to share, if you're a great speaker, start a podcast. Like I just naturally always was a, a good speaker from a young age. I just spoke at people's weddings. I actually took broadcast news in college. I had no idea that this was actually going to be my calling. I'm actually really glad that career didn't work out. And I had I went through the deep healing journey of binge eating and food addiction and all that stuff myself. And that's what birthed my business. But that background really made it very easy for me to speak with ease and so I think if you if you love talking and you get so frustrated with Instagram 60 second or 60 second limit on Instagram stories, podcasting is amazing for you. I also think that even if you don't have a business and it's like a love, like you can still grow an epic podcast and get sponsors and all of a sudden be making a bunch of money from like whatever the topic is that you're talking about. So I think that that's really important and you have to be committed you got to be in it for the long game because it's, I mean, maybe some people's podcasts blow up really fast if they've already started with a really large audience. But otherwise, you're starting from scratch. You've got to get listeners, you know, shares, reviews. Like it's going to take some time for that traction to build and for people to know, like, and trust you and actually subscribe and keep listening to your show and then consider investing their hard-earned money in you and your service. So, yeah, let's let's talk growth. Because I've, I've, you know, the biggest hurdle is consistency and actually continuing to put out um, episodes. But then there's a lot of people out there who are many, 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 many episodes in and it's them and their grandma that listen. And that mm -hmm. is it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so obviously that's not really going to help them drive revenue, build up their business. So mm -hmm. let's kind of break that down. What are some of the strategies or things that you, you've done over the years that you've seen really work and actually reaching new or new audience and actually building the subscribers? Yeah. So number one, consistency. I'm dropping episodes every Sunday and I, I ebb and flow with then dropping bonus episodes on Wednesday, some, Wednesday sometimes, whether it's guesting, solo. But I think you've got to have a consistent cadence. And what I've seen is weekly is really helpful to build that audience. I think the second thing is you don't just share your podcast and sit there and hope people listen to it. You've got to build out your platform. So do you have, you know, some kind of free opt-in for people to get on your list and then you promote it on your list, right? And then are you on social media? You've got to be there sharing your graphics, sharing your links, getting people, right? Encouraging people, reminding them to subscribe. Make sure you subscribe and share this with people that you know could benefit from it. You've got to have calls to action um, because otherwise people won't know what to do with it and they'll love it, but they won't necessarily share it. So I think like having your social platforms and your newsletter and maybe a free opt-in, like I have a free emotional eating quiz. I've got free masterclasses. People will opt in for these same things and then they get the reminder each week of the podcast coming out and they're probably following me on social. I think there's also an emotional part of it that you can have all the physical like social media and tech structures in place. But if people don't connect with you, why would they keep listening? Why would they share it? They need to feel a connection with you. And this is part of the magnetism that you can't buy, but you have to just emit from your natural experience and your story. 
So I have a story that is like I was binge eating to the point where I was eating out of my garbage can. The amount of shame and embarrassment that I felt from that was significant. And I literally hit it home in my early 20s. Three of my years of life went by like not wasted, but like, you know, at the time was very regretful for me that I spent all this time hiding at home because I hated my body because I was doing this, right? Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate, but that's a very relatable story for a lot of people in the world, especially women. And to come out and share it and be willing to be vulnerable, whatever your story is, to be authentic and to truly share your authentic self with your audience, I think is one of the most important priceless things you can do especially if you're in some kind of a coaching business where you're doing business coaching, health coaching, mindset, like energy, like anything to do with the person has to feel connected. Like I'm probably not going to walk down the street and be like, hey, like this is what I do in my year program is 10K. You want to come and work with me? And then be like, yeah, totally. Like you have to warm people up so that authenticity, the sharing and, and the relatability that holy crap, I'm not alone. Someone else has gone through what I'm going through right now that gets people engaged and listening. So I think that is such a key piece that a lot of people are worried about because they're like, what if people judge me? What if I get a bad review? What if people don't like me? What if my aunt listens and she hears me talk about this thing or my dad and then like I have to explain to them that I struggle with this thing. So you're like, you got to let all that go and you've got to just get on and get sharing. And if you're worried about the whole, oh my gosh, I'm going to run out of ideas, it never happens. I have like eight spreadsheets with like hundreds of ideas and I never even look at them. I'm like, what feels good today? Let's talk about this. And it always resonates for people, right? So to me, the structures are good, but but the expression and the authenticity is magnetizing. It's how I get a lot of my clients. And I never started a podcast be like, oh, I'm going to share authentically to get clients. It's like, I want to share and just hope that one person listens and knows they're not alone. And hopefully that helps give them hope they can heal too. And then obviously the being of service, it's a universal law. You're going to receive the abundance in return if you're in alignment and you're being authentic. Awesome. So, okay. So super authentic message, being super, really consistent, having you a lead magnet, building your email list that you can promote the episodes to, um, building on social simultaneously. So you can you know, you're creating this sort of ecosystem of multiple ways to connect with people. That's awesome. And do you leverage like a guest strategy? Like do you have, are you interviewing people? Is it just you talking? Like, what does that look like? I'll pitch them. And I've scored some pretty big podcasts in like the top 0.1%, top point, well, 0.1% is probably the biggest thus far. But that's the other thing is don't be afraid to pitch yourself because you never know who's going to say yes. A few years ago now, I pitched like a big, like I guess you call her reality star. I was like, I'm just going to email her assistant and see like whatever. They'll probably say no, but it's worth a shot. They responded back. It was a yes. I went to LA, recorded the episode in person, and it was huge. It was Whitney Port from the Hills. If I would have let my mind be like, no, I would miss out on that opportunity, right? So pitch and, and don't worry about how big their audience is because if they like your topic and it's relevant, they feel it would be a value to their listen- listeners, they'll have you on. And so I think that Pitching is important. Guesting is important. Obviously, having aligned guests, making sure that they really fit your podcast as well. And I think that's also really important because the sharing, right? You get on other people's podcasts, you're going to get a flood of new people. And no podcast is too small when it comes to you pitching others. Like I've pitched podcasts, had one person listen, sign up and buy a one-year program, right? Like it's it's so significant. So don't downplay if you're like looking at their stuff and it's like, oh, but they only have a few reviews. And this is like, no, like it could be so powerful and you could reach so many. And then, yeah, I think having the guests on and ensuring that they share. But here's the thing. Some guests don't share. Some guests yeah. don't have good podcast etiquette. And so while you're intending and asking and they've signed the thing that says they're going to share it when they don't, it's like, okay, do I want to waste energy, you know? being upset about this or moving on. So I'm very particular about who I have on my podcast because they need to be in alignment for my listeners and they need to be honoring of the policy of, right? So boundaries for me are very strong. But that to me, the community piece and like the co-creation and the guesting is an extremely important way of growing your podcast as well. Like I went on a podcast, a eating disorder podcast and the first time I went on the show and she has me on like every year now, it's great, right? So then you have these like repetitive But yeah, the first episode came out and all of a sudden that Sunday or whatever day it was, I had like 5,000 downloads within like a few hours. And I'm like, 
what is this from? And then I'm like, oh, that podcast came out. All this new traffic had a record month in my business. Like it just, it's a huge thing to make sure you're co-creating and that you're sharing a bit of, of behind the scenes of like what you're doing. What? Why are you podcasting? Maybe a little teaser about what the episode's going to be about next week. People are hungry for that little, like not quite knowing what it's going to be, but getting a little taste, right? So I think those are some of the key strategies that I have used to help me get to this point in my podcast. That's awesome. And I think the whole podcast guest thing, people kind of get that. But what I think is important that people understand is that it's both ways, mm -hmm. that you're having people on your podcast and asking them to promote their episode when it drops. And then mm -hmm. you're also going on other people's podcasts and getting in front of their audiences. And so that both yeah. of those are super important. Have you seen the, has has guests, being, being a guest on other people's podcasts been the most impactful or has it been kind of 50-50 or what do you feel like? Oh, no, it's like 75% like from being a guest on others and about 25% coming on mine. Obviously, I'm so grateful for the guests I have because they provide my audience with so much value, but it's definitely more significant when I've been on someone else's as far as how it impacts my business and my downloads and things. Yeah. I know for us, probably the biggest reason why we have guests on our podcast is because that's the easiest content to create. <laughs> like, okay. like rather than have to come up with, with a new idea every single episode, like, it would it'd be really tough. There's so many people that are looking for opportunities to speak that have a great message that can train on things in ways that we we just never would be able to, right? They they have mm -hmm. their own way of teaching. They have their their own experiences with these strategies that we're teaching. And so even even when people come on, different guests come on talking about the same strategy, they teach it in a different way. And so yeah, it adds a ton of value. But also for us on our part, it's just so easy. It's so much easier. Yeah. But like you said, you want to make sure that when people are, are coming on to your podcast that, you know, they're, they're going to be a, a good fit. And part of our process that I, I don't know that a lot of people do this, but we do this. We have a pre-interview with every guest just to make sure that, okay, are they legit? Do they actually know what they're talking about? Are they going to try to say something crazy? I like, there, there are all these <laughs> things because we've had a few bad experiences early on when we didn't do that. We just let people schedule themselves and then it wasn't a good episode. Then we, you know, we, we wasted an hour of our time recording an episode that we just scrapped that we weren't even going to do. So yeah, that part I think is, is really important. But the other part of what I love about podcasting is that the people that we are reaching are a totally different type of person. They have a much longer attention span. They're mm -hmm. much more focused. They turn, when we get clients from our podcast, they're much better clients versus, you know, getting clients from you know, like shorts or reels or things like that. Yeah, you can get a lot of exposure, but you're talking to someone who has an attention span of 60 seconds or less, right? Yeah, 100%. It's the same for me. My, the quality of client that I am signing from podcasts is is top notch. It's mm -hmm. They're the best and they're warmed up and they come on to mm -hmm. a consultation. They're like speaking your language. They're talking about the things you talk about. And it's just like, yes, they already get it right? It's a fit energetically as well. There's a chemistry between you and the client. Like that stuff is so important. And I love that you vet them. And I think that boundary is key because it's true. Otherwise you can end up with a bunch of surprises. And it is, it is a time thing and your time is valuable, right? So yeah, that's absolutely. good. Yeah. We've had folks that scoff and like, oh, you're going to use, you need my time to meet with you before. I'm like, yeah, our podcast, we take it very seriously. Yeah, <laughs> Like I'm yeah. not going to put you on an episode unless we know we can make a really awesome episode from it. So yeah, you know. <laughs> totally. I hear you. One other thing I want to mention that I forgot to mention earlier about growth is like encouraging people to share on their mm -hmm. socials and tag you so that you can, you know, thank them and tag mm -hmm. on theirs. And it just like, again, that exposure, I find that to be really helpful. And I do mm -hmm. some giveaways like a couple times a year where it's like, hey, like share the podcast, leave a review. Like it does build some traction. But for me personally, I've found that consistency and the authenticity have been like my most magnetizing, profitable aspects. So for people who are looking to build an online business, maybe they're just getting started. You know, they, they, they're not really active on social media yet. Do you feel like they need to have an offer in place first before they start a podcast? Or do you think they should just start the content creation and start the podcast, even if their their offer isn't ready to sell yet? I think you should just get started, but I think you should get that freebie up ASAP because you need your people to get on some kind of a list, right? Okay. 
and and or have some way to be able to contact you if they're like, oh my gosh, I love what this person is doing. How can I work with them? There's got to be something so that you have a quick landing page, right? You put together like the most like simple contact page on a WordPress that takes you 10 minutes to build, but just get something up. But yeah, start the content. Why wait, right? Start building now. And that consistency, right? You get your first, I think it's three months on iTunes. Like if you can get consistent and you get people listening and that boosts you up in the new podcasts and you can get in that top 10, like that's huge traction, right? And exposure. So get started right away is my opinion. Yeah, I I was guessing you were going to say that, but I just wanted to make sure (laughs) because I don't like with our clients who are, you know, they they work, they typically work on their offer first, right? And and they feel like they need to, to get the course created or their coaching program all flushed out and all ready. And they, they spend so much time on getting the thing to sell ready. And then they get it all ready and they're like, okay, now it's time to sell. And it's like, okay, well, did you build your audience yet? Right. It, yeah. That whole time that they were working on that course or that coaching program, they should have been creating content, building that audience, building their email list, and then warming those people up because it does take time that, you know, especially when you're talking about higher ticket programs, yeah. if you are, you know, doing a higher ticket coaching, consulting agency, whatever, it takes time for people to build that you know, no like and trust factor to build the trust and rapport where they're willing to drop five, ten thousand dollars on your program. It's not going to happen just like that, right? Just by mm-hmm. seeing you the first time. And yeah. if you've spent the, you know, that two or three months while you were creating your course, while you were creating your offer, spend that two or three months creating content and building your audience. Well, now you got people who are ready to buy and they're your yeah. audience. But so many times we see it where people have They've just spent all the time putting it into that offer and they, and then they're like, okay, let's ready to go. Let's, let's sell. And it's like, okay, did you build an email list? Did you build, yeah. <laughs> you know, have you been creating content? No. Okay. Well, let's go back to square one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then it can be disappointing when you put all the time into the offer and then no one's buying it. And then if, if you have a yeah. worthiness issues, you get into your head and you start questioning if there's something and it's like, no, there's nothing wrong with you, but yeah, you're right. Your audience has to be warm and know, like, and trust you regardless of if it's a $50 offer or a $5,000 offer right? And if you're making podcast episodes, like when I'm getting ready to drop something, like I talk about booking a consultation every week, like this is important. People just need to know it's there. When I'm bringing in something new, I'll tease it. And then I will create podcast topic episodes that are around the theme of whatever I'm selling. So I'm selling a hormone workshop series right now. So I'm, my episodes lately are hormone related, right? And then they'll shift and be a bit of everything there afterward. And then the next thing will come in and it might be more around business, mindset, money, energy, or emotional eating. But it's just, you know, you can get strategic with the topics and or look at your downloads. Like if I look back and go, wow, when I talked about, you know, money and energy and like how emotional eating blocks manifestation and that episode got three times more downloads than last, you know, the one before it, it's like, I'm going to talk about that again, and I'm going to really break that down. So look at your stats, look at what's happening, look at your numbers, because they're also going to tell you what your audience loves. And it's not that you have to morph everything around that, but you're creating it also for them, right? Well, it's a, a passion for you, but I think that's also important. And to see where are your listeners, because when you start to get sponsors reaching out or you start pitching sponsors, which is another way to monetize your podcast, they're going to ask you. What's your downloads every week, month? Where are your listeners? What's the demographic, right? Because they want to make sure their ROI is going to be there. So being familiar with your stats is really important and getting to know them and and having a pitch page or a media kit, right? Things like that, that you'll start preparing as it grows and you get more into that because that's a huge other avenue. Another multiple source of income is that sponsorship avenue. And some of them will come back over and over again, right? Or some will sign up for a year, right? And it can be significant. Like you can make high five, six figures in sponsorships if you have a great audience and your audience or you're, you know, promoting authentic things that you would do or use or write yourself. Like I've had all kinds of things that like Splenda has reached out to me. I'm like, no, I'm not going to (laughs) promote, you know, a poison on my podcast, right? And they pitch big money, but it's not about that to me. It's the authenticity right? Mm -hmm. So you also have to be in alignment with your message because if you start promoting things that are just for money, people will know. They'll sniff Mm -hmm. it out and they'll stop listening. It's a turn off, right? So it's another like 
maybe don't do that <laughs> if you want to grow your yeah. podcast. Be authentic all around. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get into like a little bit more into monetizing through um, sponsors and that sort of thing, it, it, it kind of ties together. But like the C- number of CTAs or the number, like what are you doing on the podcast episode itself where you're, you know, where you might have a lead magnet or you might tell them about what you offer or to book a call or like, how are you mixing that in? And then, st- you know, the second half of that is then how many sponsors and things you want to add in later. So if you can kind of break that down, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So I try to do maximum two, but I try to stick with one call to action in an episode because otherwise if you start going to the three, four, five people just deer in headlights and they don't do anything. So get very specific. For me, it's always my consultation because it's just so easy to say, go to my website, amberproof.ca, book a consultation. And it's simple, right? And then sometimes I'll forget or get bored of that and I'll say, hey, like if you're wanting some freebies and offers, like go to the emotional eating quiz, but they both opt into my newsletter. So it doesn't matter what I'm sending people to, it's always tying them into my newsletter. So it's good in that sense. And then obviously when I have something dropping a program, a masterclass, I am going to be speaking to that specifically. I'm preparing different speaking points on it. And that I find is a huge draw from the podcast into small things as well. So that's what I suggest is one call to action, two max, and make sure it's really streamlining into something you're, you know, wanting to bring people into. So with with that call to action, where are you dropping that in the episode? Is it right at the beginning? Is it somewhere in the middle? Or is it or do you save it for the very end? Yeah. So I welcome people. I share what I'm going to talk about. And then I go into my call to action right away. And then I drop it at the end again, just okay. in case people fast forward fa- past my like two to three minute intro where I'm like talking a little bit about why I'm going to be speaking on the topics that I am. So then that way they don't miss it. So I'd suggest, and sometimes right in the middle of the episode, I'll be like talking about something like, and this is why you should book a consultation, or this is why I invite you to come and join me for this. Because if you're relating to everything I'm talking about, this is for you. Why are you waiting? Come and join me. Right. And I, I switch up the language and sometimes I'm very soft, but sometimes I'm like, what is it freaking costing you? Like, get it, get over here. Let's do this. Like, do you want to keep suffering? Like sometimes you have to bring that like firmer voice and some people mm-hmm. relate to the softer voice. Some people are more of like the numbers and you're like, write down all the money you're wasting on like supplements and food and like all this stuff, whatever your business is. And it's like, add that up. Are you ready to be done mindlessly spending money? Like come and join me for this. Like, so mm-hmm. I guess communicating different ways that are resonant for the listener, whether it's visual, audible, right? The energy you're putting into it is also going to impact who's going to come and buy your offer as well that you pitch. That's exactly. huge. And then as far as like just some of the little logistics, like as far as length of podcast episodes, does it matter how long it is? Like, c- can they just be 10, 15 minute episodes or should they be longer, like 30, 30 minutes, an hour long? You know, it's, yeah, good question. So I usually span from 30 to 40 minutes, um, and that includes my intro extra. However, when I do my Wednesday episodes, they're usually like 10 to 15 minute max if I drop them. But it's ironic because some of my longest episodes have the best downloads, but then some of the shorter ones, it's like 50-50. I think it really depends on the topic for my mm-hmm. audience. But I wouldn't go, I mean, but then you look at some people and they're doing two-hour episodes and they're doing so well. So I think it's whatever you've primed your audience into, in my opinion. And if they love you, they're going to stick around for every aspect. But I wouldn't go over 30 or 40 minutes, in my opinion, because it's a lot of energy and people will listen. And if your energy is dropping off, they're going to drop off and they might stop listening. So if you can't hold your own energy for the full episode, be a bit shorter. Yeah, gotcha. And then for people who are having problems figuring out what to create content. Like maybe they have a, a handful of ideas that they could create episodes about, but then they're like, okay, I've got like five episodes here and then I'm out of ideas. How do you come up with new ideas every single week to to create content around what, what, with whatever niche you're in? Yeah, so I think part of it is to look at those five episodes you've already recorded and look at what the theme was and go, can I break that theme down into five different topics? Mm-hmm. And then can I create episodes off of each one of those, like subtopics? And then can I break those down and make that a micro focus? To me, that's one of the ways for sure. I think another way is to look at, especially if you're speaking about your own experience in your business somehow, whether it's a product you're, you've created, like whether it's a supplement or it's a hair care or it's a business product, right? Like 
talking about your personal experience and why, you know, this is important for you and the benefits of it. And where I'm going with that is that could open up into potentially like 10, 20 different topics depending on what you're trying to lead people into. Is it like something health related? Okay, let's get more specific. Is it hormonal? What specific hormone do you want to talk about? How does that hormone impact your blood sugar, your digestive health, your sleep? And then all of a sudden I have a hundred different topics I could talk about based on one hormone. Same with business. It's like, okay, uh, let's talk about money blocks. They're no different than emotional eating triggers. So here's 50 money blocks. Let me make 50 different episodes about each one of those and let me talk. And then I can make another episode on the root of that, which is my self-worth issues and my money conditioning growing up. And then I could break that down into another 20 episodes on like familial conditioning, conditioning from society, why we're not taught about money in school. Like it's just, for me, it's so easy to break it down because there's so much available. But if you're a list person, write them down and then make subtopics. I think the other thing too is if you're working with clients, even if you're not yet fully into that and like talk to friends, family members, like do many sessions with them, help them out. But in your client sessions, hello, whatever they're struggling with and you're helping them with, make podcasts about that. Oftentimes, whatever the theme has been from my week of coaching clients, I'm like, next week I need to talk about that because it's a theme that keeps coming up. I know it's going to benefit my audience. So that's another way to get ideas. And then the, the other is personal experience. So it's like if I'm healing something in my business, I've mastered something, I'm struggling with something with a hormone or money or what, mindset or whatever, I'm bringing it to the podcast and I'm talking about it to let people know, number one, I'm human. Don't put me up on a pedestal. We're all equal. It doesn't matter how much we've learned or haven't. Like I'm human too, which makes me more relatable, right? And then also that like I get it too because I've been through it or I'm going through it. And to me, that's much more attractive than someone who just seems like they're untouchable and they don't understand at all what I'm going through, right? That warmth is so important. So those to me would be some of the key ways. And if you're like, I don't know how to tap into any of that, Go online, search in your topic, and like type in ideas. Like, look at what other people are talking about and see if that sparks some interest. But to me, it's endless. Like I said, I never run out of ideas. That's awesome. I love that. So, tons of ideas. Having it one, preferably call to action, you're mixing it in a couple times throughout the episode. Do you have edited versions or are you just talking? So, all the podcasts are edited except my Raw Wednesdays, which is just me going in, no intro, no extra. It's just the content of me speaking, but my Sunday episodes are edited fully. So, intro, extra, any ads that are inserted, obviously, any like noises or things like that are edited out. I have an editor, though I don't do it myself. That to me is one of the best investments people can make is getting someone to edit and upload their podcast. You want to um, have more on the side of being able to be consistent posting, get a good editor. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you got your stuff going, you're driving traffic, you're growing, you're doing all that stuff, right? Now, when is it the right time to look at sponsorships? Like mm-hmm. when when should podcasters really look at that next step? Yeah. So I think, you know, as you're starting your podcast, make a list of sponsors that you want and and maybe make like different sections, like my dream sponsors, right? Mm-hmm. My ones that I would love to have and then ones that would be great that like maybe I could start working with sooner that w- would be willing to invest a little bit or provide product. Some companies at first will only provide product. So, but then if they see good result, they will start giving you a affiliate as well as uh, an investment to do upfront work. But I started with my list and like, what do I have around my house that I use all the time that I love that I would love to promote this business? And then I I and my VA started to reach out to these companies and start relationship building. So I think this is one of the other things that people miss is they just assume, and maybe this works for some people, but I'm a relationship builder. I like to reach out, get to know the owners, people that work within the company and build a solid relationship because then when I come and pitch them and say, hey, I've got this podcast, right? Like this is my listenership. I'm 90% female. They are very invested. They will invest in their health. They will support buying this product. If I'm speaking about it, they trust me. They're going to buy what I suggest. They're far more likely to come and work with me and not question anything. Obviously, they'll probably want to see my stats, but they're like, yeah, let's give it a go. Like, what's your rates? Let me know. And they're in and they're in for three to six months and or some are in for a year, just depending on what the product is or their budget is and when you pitch them in the year. Because if you pitch them around this time of the year, they're going to be like, unless they have a big budget, they're going to say, hey, like reach out in January. We've spent. So Mm -hmm. the timing of year, especially for health wellness stuff, 
by end of July into August, most of them have spent most of their budget already and are planning 2025 budgets. So have that in mind when you're pitching unless it's uh, quite a big company. So make your list, look at what you have around home or what you're using. Obviously, if it's like a business thing or um, podcasting, like who do you want to reach out to? I saw this guy on social media. This is a side note, but this is exactly how it works. He's a 67-year-old man on Instagram. His name is Joey Bro, and he sings horrible karaoke. He's horrible, <laughs> but his energy is so magnetic, and he's got like the southern twang, and he's got his little phrases that he says, and he's so confident. Now he has this freaking karaoke machine companies like paying him to promote their companies on his Instagram. He's got like 170,000 followers or hundreds like he's blown up, but it's just this consistency and like his energy. And now he's like getting these massive sponsors. Right. So I know it's like random and it like it doesn't matter what you're talking about or per like sharing like there is a sponsor available for you. Is I guess my point with that story. You, you should go and like check it out if you want a good laugh. It's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> but make sure they're in alignment with your message. Like I'm not going to promote a karaoke company because that makes no sense for my business, right? But vitamins, supplements, superfoods, protein powders, like skincare, body care. I've had all kinds of things like that. Other energy healers that want to get more exposure, right? So there's been all kinds of things like that. So it just really depends on your niche. Surround yourself with the products and the services that you would like to have pay you to promote them and then start relationship building in my opinion obviously you can reach out and start pitching but some may not look at you or have a cold response if they don't right there's like you just want my money or what right like warming up those relationships is really important and showing that there's a value and an equal exchange each way start with small ones some may start want to start with product be willing to do that in the beginning honestly like, I don't know how much money I've saved on not having to buy the products that I use all the time because they're constantly shipping me product, right? Mm -hmm. So that's also great in the beginning. And some companies still do well. We're working together like, hey, we have this new thing. We're going to ship you like 15 or 20 of them and you can give some away and keep some. And it's great. So that's good juice. So don't be like so fast to shut that down if they're not paying right away because mm -hmm. sometimes it takes a bit of that kind of exchange first with sponsors and take the affiliate link. If they're not willing to pay you like X amount of hundreds or thousands of dollars right away, start with the affiliate link where you share it. And if people buy, you get a percentage because what if 500 people buy that thing? That's going to be a really good, right? Even if 10 people buy it and you have 10 companies that you have affiliate links with and you're making X hundreds or thousands of dollars a month, that's another source of income all of a sudden, mm -hmm. right? And then eventually they'll be like, hey, we've noticed numbers are up. Like we want to invest in more ads or can we like this is another thing I do I don't just do podcast ads I'll bring the owner onto the podcast so they can my audience can meet them that builds more clout you know like and trust in them investing in the product and then I will blend that and do newsletter promo social media promo YouTube promo and so then now not only is my podcast feeding and promoting this this brand and this product that I love so much but it's getting fed from everything that I'm offering which is going to up my affiliate, get more people into a product that's going to help them, right? And this company are, and I are going to have a relationship for a really long time. So with, with getting sponsors, is there a certain level of audience that you should have built up to before you start seeking out sponsors? Like, should, should you look at downloads or listens? Like, what, at what point do you start looking at that? Yeah. So I think if you're going to ask for that they pay you, you've got to have downloads, you've got to have listeners. So I find usually the questions that they'll ask you are how many downloads do you get a week or month, depending on your cadence, right? How many downloads do you have? And, you know, how many episodes have you dropped? And where is your listenership? The, the top three places. And those are the things that are going to appeal to them most. Because obviously, if it's a product in a country that they don't ship to your place, like they're not going to probably be interested, right? So I think it's important if you're wanting a monetary exchange right off the bat, you've got to have numbers. Because otherwise they might go, well, you don't have numbers. Like, how are we going to get our ROI? Unless you ha already have a really big social media reach that is very active and a big newsletter list, then they may be interested. But otherwise, they're probably going to want to go with affiliate, like where you make percentage and you share a link and or product in kind first. If you're eager to like dive into your first episodes and try and get sponsorship, unless you're good friends with the person and they're like, yeah, of course, I'll support you. Right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I find like right away, I would say within 
six to eight months of the podcast, like I was, I had made my list and I was reaching out and I was getting sponsors every month. And I was probably at that time about, I don't know, a thousand downloads a week. And then, yeah. yeah, So, but I could have probably done it a bit before that. I was just like a little nervous that no one would want to, because, you know, you want to build your numbers up. But once you hit the million download mark and you put that in your pitch, like, and don't do that, obviously, unless you actually have the downloads because they'll sniff it out and see in the numbers. Like people sometimes aren't authentic, right? And then when no one buys the thing, it's like, how is this possible, right? So, mm-hmm. um, but once you are over that million or even 500K download mark, like share that in your pitch when you email these companies because that's what they're looking for. Like how many, down- like I said, 10,000, 500,000, they want to know that you have a consistent audience and ideally really strong listenership in the United States and Canada. That's huge for them as well. And then the rest really comes down to the niche of what you do. Okay. So when you say the 500,000 download mark or a million download, is that total downloads over the the history of the show? Or is that like in a month or? Well, I mean, gosh, if you're to that point where you're 500K to a million a month, I'm pretty sure like any sponsor (laughs) is going to be like, how much do you want us to pay you? Because we're in. I'm not quite there yet. That's a goal. But to me, like once they see you've hit the 500,000 download mark, like as a whole or the million download mark, they know you're serious. They know you're committed. You're showing up consistently and that you're probably quite reliable, right? Okay. So I think it's maybe a bit of like a clout piece, I guess, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. They know you're, you like, you have a real audience, right? So when, when you reach out to sponsors and, you know, you kind of present the idea of them sponsoring your, your podcast. And maybe they come back with an offer. Do you ever go back and forth and negotiate or do you just typically just accept whatever they, they're willing to offer? Uh, no, I negotiate because it's got to be worth my time and energy. Plus, I'm paying team members. So it's not just me. And I, I've got to make sure that everything's covered and that I'm getting what I need to. So I think don't be afraid to negotiate. Honor your value and your worth. And at the same time, also be realistic with your numbers and what your da- downloads and things are. And don't expect that if you have right? Like, I don't know, 500 downloads a week, I wouldn't expect like a 10k payday, or even like a $5,000 payday, unless your audience is like, almost every listener is purchasing, right? Some small accounts have a very magnetic, very involved audience that will drop money. But unless you have that, be willing to negotiate a bit. But I really know my value and my worth and what my time is worth and, and the investment into the sponsorship. So I'm pretty solid on my prices. Obviously, they've gone up though as my downloads have gone up, as my listenership has gone up, and as I've had a lot of sponsors and gotten those success stories from them, gotten that thank you, that note, that video, and I have it in my media kit. I have it on my website, right? So I have that proof as well, which makes it easier for the company to want to invest. So I think that it really depends on where you're at in your podcast journey as far as that's concerned. In the beginning, you probably do want to accept right? But make sure that the people you're working with are great to work with because you can get yourself into some fun situations if you just take whatever and then they're extremely difficult and all of a sudden you're doing like 20 more hours of work to prepare the things than you thought because you didn't sign a contract or have an agreement up front or with what is expected of you and the other party. So also, I guess my other point with that is make sure the expectations are very clear up front of what you are expected to do right? Because otherwise it could end up being a ton more work for you. And then you like, that was not worth it at all. Right. Mm -hmm. And we end up in burnout. Absolutely. Awesome. This has been such a fun conversation. If people want to learn more about you, where should they head? Yeah. The best place is either amberproof.ca, the website. If you're wanting to learn more about me and my journey with food and business and health and all the things, you can take the free quiz, book consultation, but the podcast, of course, Come and take a listen to just get a feel for what I'm talking about and what I embody myself in. It's the No Sugar Coating Podcast. And of course, it's available everywhere, including on the website. But that's just going to give you some insight into what I'm talking about with like being authentic, sharing from your heart, which to me is extremely important. And I'm on social. It's my name, Amber Romaniuk, R-O-M-A-N-I-U-K. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amber. We really appreciate you. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Digital Trailblazer podcast. For show notes and information about today's guest, head to digitaltrailblazer.com. Now, if you love this episode, if you got some value, make sure you leave us a review and subscribe. And be sure to share this episode with anyone you know who could use help to build their business. 
Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time.